Okay. Um, now, um, first, well, I think the best thing to do while waiting for anybody else uh, to come is uh, deal with, of course, homework-related matters. Uh, so, uh, everyone who has uh, submitted uh, homework one should have gotten an email back from me with that uh, graded. Um, so you can, I'll have a um, full list of uh, what your deductions on. Um, please look it over if you're not sure that you should have lost points on something. Um, then you know, certainly let me know because um, there's always a possibility of a mistake. Um, if I happen to mark something right uh, that uh, you actually didn't complete, then I guess you just take it and move on. Um, so, um, <clears throat> what I don't know shouldn't hurt you. So, um, okay. But if that's something I'll be doing with uh, all of the assignments, just to make sure everybody has a clear idea of um, what they need to uh, work on. Uh, not today, but probably on Thursday, what I'll do is um, pick out certain problems from homework one that um, seem to cause the class as a whole the most trouble and uh, um, talk about uh, those specifically. Um, okay, now uh, let's shift to homework two. Um, first, I want to know how far have you guys gotten on it? I get a, I have an idea based on which problems people are asking about, but that's what I'll try to get a good feel for overall. Um, um, like how many have gotten in, uh, at least gotten into 2.2? Okay, how many have Got most of it done. <laughs> okay, yeah, I kind of dwindled after that. <laughs> so, um, okay. See why I tell you guys to start these things early. So, um, and as, as far as um, uh, you know, due dates and uh, when various things are happening, um, I've already used some of the wiggle room that I have. I I, I don't have much left. Um, so I want to take a uh, little time to, oh, first, uh, I got a bunch of uh, questions today, email questions from people. Um, so yeah, between today and last night, five new questions. So be sure to check that out um, in case you haven't uh, finished those problems. Um, OK, now. Uh, so, so okay. So here, okay. So here's where we at, where we're at right now. Um, and keep in mind, this is the already pushed back due date for uh, uh, for, for homework two. So as, as you can imagine, that when I haven't seen much in the way of questions on section two point two, it kind of registered a bit of a bit of alarm. Um, now, the other thing to the uh, Want to make you guys aware of is um, you know, we're already um, somewhat into the following chapter, uh, which is uh, chapter six, and you know, I've already posted the assignments on that, which is uh, due down here. Not for a while; that's uh, three weeks from today. Um, and then um, all of this stuff, uh, go chapter chapter two, chapter six, not 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 the MATLAB stuff. Is uh, all that will be on the the midterm, which you can see in practice one here. So you get a clear idea as to which material is going to be covered. Um, and that's certainly what I'll emphasize as I um, uh, cover each section. So if we are to uh, try to stay on schedule, and uh, and the thing is, I want you all to be in a situation where when the midterm comes along, um, you're not trying to cram. Everything, uh, including preparing for it, um, any you know, finishing homework related to it, you know, doing that all at once. So, um, but something tells me that uh, after um, after you all get 
homework two out of the way. Which is hopefully uh, soon. Um, out of the 21 of you, I've had uh, one submission. Um, that uh, you know, there's, there's a fair number of problems for homework three. You've seen how challenging problems can be. Um, and we're far enough along and you have a pretty good feel for that, I hope. And um, so what should you do once homework two is out of the way? Gold star for you. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, because, because if, otherwise what's going to happen is you get into a situation where you're going back over material that these problems are on long after I've covered it. Um, so you have to dig all that up again. Um, you know, go back, nothing, nothing's fresh in your mind. You, know, you can go back and watch videos, etc. Um, but, you know, Doing the usual habits of um, you know, waiting till you know, the last couple days, even though you don't really know, or you're probably severely underestimating how long it's going to take, um, you're throwing off a rhythm of my class. <laughs> so it's 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 really undermining me and driving me crazy. So stop it. Um, now I will offer for, for future assignments, or maybe I could kind of do it for homework three because. I mean, you haven't really started that yet. Um, now, and, and you can tell me if this would help. Um, that, like, as I, since ob obviously there's a natural breakdown of each assignment into these sections, should I set due dates for individual sections? Would that actually make a difference? Okay, I see. I, I see. I've seen both answers. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so um, I'm just asking you guys not to shoot yourselves in the foot. And I'm amazed that I have to ask that. Um, but um, it, it really helps things flow better for everybody. Uh, this is not, I'm not asking this um, out of convenience for me. I mean, each day I'm going to be able to fill the time with something useful. But I'd like to fill the time with the most useful thing. Um, and also... Have you guys in the best shape when it's time for you to really perform, which is um, on the tests, which the midterm and finals together account for 70% of your grade. So, um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I mean, if it might help anybody, even if not everybody, I could put guidelines uh, as to, um, and just, instead of having these dates that are um, all you know spaced out, um, but, um, what I'm pondering doing as, um, hopefully, well, I, I think it would almost have to be a, uh, final <laughs> schedule adjustment just because I'm going, like I said, I'm, I'm running out of wiggle room is, um, uh, I, um, because we have a uh, fall break right here, um, and then the midterm right after might slide, let the slide just, one more day, so you have your fall break, that could, which could be a good uh, catch-up time. Like if you haven't finished homework three yet, you can do it then. Then we come back on Tuesday. We have a review Thursday midterm, which would definitely be well past the midpoint. Um, but um, but at least in terms of chapters covered on by on test, that that, that still is midpoint. But what's going to happen, and the only other thing I would change is I'm still going to start the following chapter at this point just because there are things to get through. Um, and uh, so I would just go one section further before fall break. Um, and But the thing is, all of that stuff, like numerical differentiation in the very beginning of numerical integration, that's all related to polynomial interpolation too. Um, it's where we're actually using it for something. Um, so that could actually help with your, um, uh, like, to, to help solidify those concepts. Um, okay, so I think I'm, things would be a bit, a bit cleaner that way. But um, whatever I do with schedule, I'll do very soon. Like, have it up uh, uh, tonight. Um, okay, but um, what? But really, if this works better, if instead of 
having periods where you're not really tuned into this class at all, like, you, like you're showing up and that's it, and then all of a sudden, oh, dude is coming, bam, a lot of activity. And um, that doesn't really work well for any class. Um, and I think it really shows in the fact that it doesn't matter what class it is, um, that material doesn't really get retained. It's, 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 it's consumed to, to regurgitate on a test. Sorry for a gross metaphor. And uh, then it's all promptly forgotten. Um, and it's not even useful later that semester, let alone in a subsequent course that needs it. And you know how math is, how unforgiving math is about that. Um, but a more steady exposure, uh, you know, so maybe not as, not as much in any one week, uh, but you know, something that's you know, spaced out more is, is, is more conducive to really uh, retaining these things. So, um, I mean, I'm doing this class a lot differently than two years ago for a reason. And that is that um, even though it was a whole lot easier for me personally, um, that uh, I know that the students who took it back then, um, they didn't really master it. Um, and that's, that's, that's why I'm trying some, some different things. Um, I also found out today that the um, the textbook is because it's about to be published. It has a ISBN number, ISBN number, and everything has been officially adopted for the next semester, 461. Although they say it's they, they left me off as an author, so Exploration and Miracle Analysis by Amber C. Sumner. Um, so I'm at your local bookstore long after the semester is over. Um, <coughs> okay, so if you see that, then when you're Dealing with textbooks for next semester, a mistake I'll have to fix. Okay, now let's talk about any questions. We have time, so uh, questions on homework two. I'm sure you got them. What? Okay. Um, Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, this one. Um, so, and actually, I want to have trying something a little different here too, with uh, formatting. Um, so having a textbook and MATLAB up at the same time for. Um, oh, okay. Hold on. Um, apparently, there's a connection issue with Hattiesburg from from people down in Gulf Park. All right. Um, Okay, Karate, you're going to try disconnecting and reconnecting and see if that helps. Sure. Yeah. All right. Welcome to a Cisco meeting. You are entering the meeting now. Hmm. Uh, yeah, because I just got an email from one of the students down there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna let them know. Um, Okay. Um, well, that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> not really sure what can be done about that. So, I've, well, at least I've made them aware of a situation. Well, at least they'll have this recording, um, if absolutely nothing else. Um, okay. So, all right. So for so for this problem, okay. So this is uh, whoops diary.
Okay. Um, all right. Now, um, so there's a disconnect here between um, the, nota the generic notation that's used for talking about computing approximations and a notation that is used for this specific problem. And there's some overlap. So, which is going to cause some fits, which actually is, it's intentional but not sadistic. Um, it, because sometimes these kind of notation overlaps happen and we have to focus on not the symbol that's being used, but what does the symbol actually mean? What role is it playing? Because, um, like, like for instance, sometimes when I use or I reuse a letter for a certain purpose, and students think it means the old thing, it's like, well, no, that's it's something completely different now. Um, oh, we might have something. Okay, I'll see if this works. Hello. Gotcha now. Okay, good. Um, believe it or not, have not missed much. Uh, uh, well, okay, I pontificated a bit, um, but well, it'll be on the recording. Um, we're we're uh, dealing with uh, questions on uh, homework two, uh, starting with uh, this one, uh, 2.1.11. Okay, so in a generic case, we're, we're computing y equals f of x, and what role does each of these symbols play? x is the input, f is the algorithm that takes the input and produces the output, and then y is that uh, output. Now in a specific case, we're solving uh, f of c, uh, f of x is equal to c, um, but um, if we want to exp express this in the form y equals f of x, something like that, we have to invert this. So this is c is equal to f inverse of, um, sorry, x is equal to f inverse of c. So as far as what's playing the different roles now, that's before, same as before, same roles, we have uh, c is the input, f inverse is the algorithm, um, and then x is the output. Maddening, I know, um, but these are things that unfortunately happen. Um, uh, especially as you go to higher level math, that, that these role reversals take place and you have to adjust, okay, so what um, role is each symbol playing? What is the, the meaning of it? Um, okay, now, if we look at the um, relative condition number, um, and in this case, instead of using the definition, I call for using, uh, this, this is important, uh, using uh, equation 2.1, um, estimated by, um, now again using a notation for the generic problem, x f prime of x over f of x. So what you have to do is, okay, so, so here, another, another way to uh, phrase that is, whatever the input is, times the derivative of the algorithm evaluated at the input, divided by um, the uh, um, same algorithm again with that input uh, plugged in. So whatever's playing these roles are what you need to uh, fill in um, in this case. And um, because we're dealing with an inverse function, this is the sort of thing that um, actually in the calculus sequence here, I'm not entirely certain that this is covered at all. Does anyone even remember having this covered in a class, like here anyway? Yeah, uh, I remember when I taught calculus at um, uh, UC Irvine and we're getting into exponential logarithmic functions, so we actually um, covered those as if they were not seen before, uh, even though, because. Uh, well, exponential log are, are those covered in um, like logarithms? Is that that's covered in one hundred and one, isn't it? Any zone workers here would know that. So. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's certainly nothing to do with derivatives of it. But yeah, we introduced them as, uh, brand new, and then because it's calculus, we're also covering derivatives of them. And but we also talk about inverse functions in general. So okay, 
Well, this is something that seems to come in handy more often than you think. So I'm just going to, just for fun, derive it right now. Um, so what you do is, um, so an inverse function, and by inverse function, I mean, for example, square, square root are inverse functions of e each other, or exponential logarithmic functions are inverses of each other, that kind of inverse. Um, they satisfy these relationships. Um, so f of f inverse of x is x. Also, uh, other way, f inverse of f of x equals x. So, so they cancel each other out um, in this sense. So what I'm going to do to give you a differentiation rule for um, the uh, um, inverse function is I'm going to take uh, this relationship here, and I'm going to differentiate both sides of it. Um, f of f inverse of x is equal to x. Um, now, since I have f of f inverse of x, um, what rule do I need to use to differentiate that? Yes, yeah, so this is a chain rule. Um, okay, so what we get is f prime so outer function, the derivative of the outer function, evaluated at the inner function, times the derivative, and I'll put in a ddx here, of the inverse function. So that's what we actually want a derivative of. And that is equal to the derivative of the right side, which is 1. Well, now we just rearrange. We want to isolate the derivative of the inverse function. So it's 1 over f prime of f inverse. Um, so uh, this can actually be used to um, derive certain differentiation rules that you're already familiar with. For example, um, uh, okay, take uh, inverse sine. Does anyone know the derivative of inverse sine? Kind of. It's definitely non-triggy. Uh, it's, it's like theta x minus negative theta x squared. No, it's hyperbolic cosine. cosine yeah. um, no, it's, um, well, okay, I'll, I'll show you now. Um, this is why it's good to remember your low lo lower level math. Um, so, for exa so example, um, f of x is uh, sine x. So then I want uh, derivative of inverse sine of x is equal to 1 over f prime, but that's cosine, of inverse sine of x. So you can always write it that way. But now it's possible to write this in a way that's, um, uh, um, that doesn't involve uh, trig functions. Okay. Um, so the way you can do that is using, I'm not sure if I can do this here, but uh, Right triangle trig. Um, so the thing is, uh, cosine of uh, theta, oh, so I'm going to let um, theta, or t, equal inverse sine of uh, x. And therefore, we want uh, cosine of t. Now, right triangle trig, what's cosine? In terms of like the parts of a right triangle, adjacent, opposite? opposite. No. Adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, adjacent over um, hy uh, hypotenuse. Um, but the thing is, we also have um, uh, sine t is equal to x, and sine is opposite over um, hypotenuse. So if we go ahead and um, make, um, so I'm going to select. Um, Simplest relationship possible. Opposite is equal to x, and hypotenuse is equal to 1. So cosine t is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, hypotenuse is 1, so it's just the adjacent. So if my opposite is x and my hypotenuse is 1, what's the adjacent? Yeah, square root of 1 minus x squared. So in conclusion, um, the yeah, derivative of inverse sine of x is equal to um, 1 over square root of 1 minus um, x squared. So, 
Um, okay, and um, if you were doing inverse cosine, it'd be exactly the same, but the thing is then the you have minus sine down there, so the derivative is actually minus this. Um, and there are other rules that can be derived in a, in a similar way, like, like all the inverse trig functions, including um, uh, inverse tangent, uh, you know, 1 over 1 plus x squared, and so on. Okay, so that was fun. Uh, a little bit of, well, you we think we covered in Cal 1, but again, I'm not sure where this is covered. I should bring this up at a faculty meeting. It might be the most interesting thing talked about there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, let me say this to be immortalized on YouTube. I really, 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 bleep, 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 hate faculty meetings. Um, so, anyhow, um, they're just too long. So, um, Okay, so, so this differentiation rule right here is what you need to use in this problem uh, to get an expression for the um, uh, relative condition number. And when we get to the last chapter of a course, chapter 9, and we talk about solving equations like this, this is going to become important for um, discussing when this problem is uh, ill-conditioned. It depends on f and how it behaves near the uh, uh, root of the equation that you're looking for. Okay, anything more about homework two? Yes? Can you explain to me more about vague physics questions? Okay. Yeah. I love vague questions like that. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, now in um, okay, let's see. Actually, I think what I'll do is mm, and, I, and I assume for a case where you have a um, like h going to zero. Um, that, or at least that's a situation that comes up in homework. Um, Yeah. And you said it's less than 1 by n? Yeah. So how did you make that number? Oh, um, so really, um, yes, okay, so as far as how you go about finding um, upper bounds for functions, um, because we, we can really say that the, any function we can say that is greater than or equal to this, um, we can say it's big O of that function. But we like to have a simplest function that gives the sharpest estimates of um, how, um, how much this function is either growing or decaying, or in this case, decaying to zero as uh, n goes to infinity. So, um, so for one thing, um, so you're asking like, um, OK, I guess there's two questions I can answer, and hopefully this covers it. Um, number one, what made me choose 1 over n? And the answer to that is looking at the powers of n above and below. Um, you look at the difference between them. Here we have only a constant, so it's n to the 0. Down below we have n to the 1. So the difference between them of uh, having um, you know, this, this power minus this power being minus 1 leads me to c compare with 1 over n. Um, and then what I can do is I if I want to make this less than or equal to a simpler function than itself, I can do anything that makes the denominator larger or the numerator smaller, because that makes the whole fraction bigger. So in this case, I can like dr drop any positive lower order terms. I can drop a plus 2. And that's how I conclude this is less than or equal to 1 over n. Now, unfortunately, if this was um, minus 2, I could not be so sure about that. But then I might have to settle for, like, instead of saying less than or equal to 1 over n, maybe it's less than or equal to 
a constant times 1 over n. And that's fine too. Now keep in mind the definition of big O notation right here is constant factors like this are neglected. You don't include them in here. So um, we're just trying to get an idea of uh, growth rate. Um, like you might remember in Cal 3, um, where you, for dealing with convergence of sequences, you had several different kinds of functions. You had polynomials, uh, exponentials, factorials, um, n to the n, and so forth. And you had to know for that class which functions grew faster than which other functions. And we won't try to express, now in this case it's not growth, it's decay. We have uh, something going to zero, but, um, but, the, but knowing those same kind of growth rates is helpful uh, for this too. Yes? Oh, um, okay, so well, but the thing is for this, um, you're actually going to get polynomial order growth. And the way you can see that is by replacing H with its, um, uh, with, its, with its Taylor expansion. Now the thing is, now suppose that these terms, the minus H and the minus 1 over H squared, suppose those terms were not there. And you go ahead and take the limit as H goes to 0. You're still getting 1. Um, so you're getting one whether these terms are there or not. But what's going to be different is the result you would get as far as um, how fast it's converging to one. Um, so what you need to do is um, expand e to the h in the effort interest of trying to cancel as many of these terms as you can. Um, so, uh, so certainly you want to go out as far as uh, the h squared term, and then one term more to, so that you have a remainder. Um, and then you'll be able to correctly pinpoint, um, like, your answer is going to be, like, order h to the p, and the question is, what is p? Um, let me make a note of that here. Um, uh, Um, all right, so because um, otherwise you might get the wrong rate of convergence. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, yeah, you are. Now, now um, actually, I want to make a suggestion about that problem. Okay. Uh, um, okay. So what you're doing is you are um, use, yeah plugging into these formulas. You're given x naught. You're given f, and there's uh, selected values of h uh, specified. Um, now, um, now one thing to keep in mind is one fourteen. Get the exact answer, which you certainly know what that is, uh, since. It, you have a function of a simple derivative and you're given the value of x. Because you need to make sure to check what you're getting against that value to see, like, okay, is it getting more accurate or not? Um, okay. Uh, okay, and then once you see what the behavior is, then, um, then, then the question becomes, uh, um, can you explain why that behavior uh, might be happening. And to get an idea, um, if you're not sure what, what's going on, um, try examining uh, the individual expressions, fx0 plus h, f of x0 minus h, f of x0, um, that make up this overall expression, you know, here and then this one here. Uh, that could, if you're not sure why you're getting a behavior that you're seeing, Looking at those individual terms might help explain. <clears throat> okay. Any 
Anything more? Is 2.1.13 asking us to pretty much do the same thing as 12? Are we finding a rate of convergence? Is that the same thing? Um, well, um, Yes and no. Uh, yes, because you are finding a rate of convergence. Or really, but no, because you're actually told what the rate of convergence is. Um, that that's you have that from here. So you kind of like basically what you're doing is you're verifying it. Okay. And the the example above actually does not assume that the rate of convergence is already known, but the manipulations are very similar. So I'd, I'd, I'd recommend more of uh, following this. Okay. Okay. All right. No one's questions about 2.2? The vast sea of problems that's there? You're going to dump them on me on, on Thursday? I should make time for that, apparently. <laughs> going once, going twice. Why do I bother? OK. <clears throat> um, okay. Now, um, Before I look at anything else in the textbook, um, polynomial interpolation. Um, now, as a recap of uh, where we're at with that, um, and what does it, this will be useful for, and this will be coming up uh, shortly before uh, fall break, um, we're going to see later uh, that polynomial interpolation is useful for approximating derivatives. Uh, and integrals for other purposes too, but these will be of most interest to us um, in the uh, uh, short term. And um, so, but, but, and to recap, what the problem that we're solving is that we're given um, n plus 1 points in the plane um, like x, x on x1 up to x. Um, and yn, uh, find a polynomial of degree n, which are called pn of x. Um, and that polynomial um, is unique. And what I didn't really talk about uh, uh, last week, uh, Dr. Chen may have covered this to a certain extent uh, when, when he was here. Um, the straightforward and really dumb approach. Um, to get the coefficients of uh, this polynomial is you use the fact that um, you get linear equations from these conditions that the polynomial has to satisfy. That this polynomial, if I plug in any of these x values, x0, x1, up to xn, you have to get out the corresponding y value. So this gives you n plus 1 equations for n plus 1 unknowns, which are the, um, the coefficients of this uh, polynomial. So if I assume that uh, this polynomial has coefficients like a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared and so forth up to, it's a little bigger, a n x to the n, then we get equations like this, a0 plus a1x0 plus a2x0 squared, and so forth. And, that, and we just set that equal to the corresponding y value. So I can do the same thing for um, all the x values. So I'll just change the subscripts here that aren't really subscripts. Um, and I keep going all the way down to the last. 
So I have these n plus 1 equations. And the thing is, these equations, we have all these different powers of the x's, but the x's are known. It's um, the a's, the coefficients, that are uh, unknown. So we solve this for the coefficients. Um, and the matrix is called a van der Waals matrix. Did Dr. Jen mention this? Okay. Fortunately, we're not really dealing with this. And for the reason I gave up above, this is an absolutely terrible way to do polynomial interpolation, which is why I didn't talk about it last week. But just highlight the reasons. Why? Um, using big O notation, order n cubed arithmetic operations um, to solve this system of equations. So in other words, the, the number of operations you need is, it's really like, two-thirds n cubed plus, and then there's lower order terms that are less significant. Um, and to give context, order n squared is uh, possible. The other methods that we're actually focusing on uh, make that happen. So, so first of all, it's a slow method. Um, also, um, uh, this problem is uh, ill-conditioned if any of the x values, we're assuming all the x values are different, um, but if, a, if any of them are very close together, um, this is an ill-conditioned problem, in the, in conditioning in the sense that from, from section 1.2.1, uh, um, and uh, so, so that makes um, this solution approach, uh, you basically you, you might get, um, a, with floating point arithmetic, a very uh, off answer. Um, so that's why um, we don't bother with that. It's an easy way to see that the solution is unique, and um, actually the, the, the uniqueness of a solution is proved in, uh, in a textbook in two different ways. Um, so, so that's why uh, last Thursday I showed you one better approach, Lagrange interpolation. Um, so. Uh, so we use we form the Lagrange polynomials for our x's, and then we multiply them by our y's, um, and we have our polynomials. So that I did to death last uh, time, but the drawback to that is um, what if we need to add new interpolation points? What if we interpolate using a polynomial degree um, uh, five, let's say? and we find it doesn't do a good job for our purposes, we want to bump it up to degree six. Using the same points as before, but adding one more. Um, we have to um, we basically have to start over. Uh, you have to toss out the old Lagrange polynomials, build up new ones. Um, it's, it's, it's a pain. Um, so today, and also this will spill over into Thursday, I'll talk about alternative number two. And that's called Newton interpolation. Um, okay, and uh, on the midterm, you'll have to know both kinds of interpolation. Like you'll be given some x and y values, and you need to come up with an interpolating polynomial using either Lagrange form or Newton form. Um, now, the interpolating polynomial is unique, and there, there are other ways here that we won't see. But um, so how? However you do it, the end result is going to be the same, but each approach has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, because Lagrange interpolation is still nice for, um, uh, like when we use it later for uh, uh, derivatives and integrals. So, so we're not we're not junking it all together, but we do want um, more than one approach on hand. Okay, um, now, um, so the thing is. P n of x can have literally infinitely many forms, but they all have something in common. I can say that P n of x is equal to a sum from, let's say, j equals 0 to n of uh, some coefficient that I'll call cj, and then, um, okay, I'll call this a uh, phi phi j of x. So, so you're, in other words, you're expressing your interpolating polynomial as a linear combination of some sort of polynomial of degree at most n. Um, so what are the different possibilities? 
or as power form. This is, you may not have heard the term before, but this is a form of polynomials that we are all most used to. So, um, so the phi j's are equal to 1, x, x squared, x cubed, and so forth, up to x to the n. Uh, and we all prefer to write polynomials out this way. It's very convenient. Um, so I just, so we take a linear combination of these. And this van der Mohn approach, the system of equations up here, gives us those coefficients. But we're not dealing with that any further. Uh, then there's Lagrange form. So each phi j is simply equal to the Lagrange polynomial that we saw last week for um, for your your uh, x values. Um, now for um, and now the, the difference is one key big difference between this form and this form is that here power form we have. Um, polynomials of degree 0, 1, 2, increasing up to n. Whereas Lagrange polynomials, all of them are of degree n. And that can happen. As, as long as there's degree at most n, that, that works. Now for Newton form, it's something entirely different um, altogether. Um, it's a linear combination of these polynomials. First we have 1, and then we have x minus x naught, and then x minus x naught, x minus x1. And then this keeps going, like uh, x minus x naught, x minus x1, x minus x2, and so forth. And we keep going, each time adding on one more linear factor. I shouldn't say adding on, we're multiplying by it, but you get the idea. Um, and the, you stop when you get to degree n. Um, up to x minus x n minus 1. So now we have from, if I number these from 0, 1, 2 up to n minus 1, that's n factors altogether, so that's why it's degree n. So we never have x minus xn included in here. We don't need it. Um, but what this means is, if I ever need to add on another point, I go on to the end of my collection, and they don't have to be in any order. Because these points are not assumed to be sorted. Um, then I can keep my old polynomial and just add one more term on and the rest of my work is not disturbed. Um, so that's the best thing about the um, uh, Newton form. Um, it's also um, probably easier to code than um, the other ways of uh, coming up with these polynomials. And that's, that's going to be important for homework three, because the only explorations I assigned from this section, section 6.3, and I should have mentioned this way up, and I'll edit the diary accordingly. So, um, so Newton, well, Lagrange, better yet, power form that's covered in six, uh, section 6.1, Lagrange, 6.2, Newton, 6.3. I'm kind of talking about all of these just to give context. But now, for during what time we have left today, I want to focus on Newton. Uh, that's the section on divided differences. And I'm not covering all of this section. There's a certain parts I'm focusing on, like the Newton form right here, um, and uh, uh, computing divided differences, which is how you get the Newton form. But the only explorations I assigned from this section, there are quite a few of them, but I only assigned three. And um, they're all coding. Um, you're welcome. So. Um, like uh, yeah, this one here, um, and um, actually, I'll get this out of the way. So explorations from section 6.3. So there's uh, 6. Point, and the list is already inside, 6.3.6. .6, and that is basically you're implementing an algorithm that's already given in this section in the uh, uh, pseudocode. It's um, this one, implementing uh, algorithm. 6.3.4. And actually, I should edit the problem to make clear that it's um, that this is what you're doing. Um, and then you do uh, next expression 6.3.8, where you're going to implement algorithm 6.3.6 .6 and then use it for the task that's described there, um, where um, what you're doing is, if you are given 
a polynomial in Newton form, how do you get it into power form? So that's what this exploration is about. And then finally, 6.3.9, um, MATLAB has a function called polyfit, where you give it x values, y values, and a degree, and it computes the interpolating polynomial for you. You're going to implement your own that uses the Newton form to produce the exact same results. So in other words, you can compare it against polyfit, and you should get exactly the same thing. Uh, once you've done expiration 6 and 8 in this section, uh, this one, even though it's part of a long-winded description, is extraordinarily trivial, because all you're doing is you're calling your upper functions. Um, so, so it's not as much work as it seems. Um, <clears throat> but the previous two will still provide um, some challenge. But, um, but, th this, but these are the things you're going to be drawing on in the text to, uh, to handle. And that, that, that's all for, uh, for this section. Okay. Um, now, um, so given all of these points, the x's and y's, from 0 up to n. We know how to get the Lagrange polynomial. We covered it last time, but how do we get the Newton form? Um, so the first step is get the what are called divided differences. Uh, these are the coefficients of the uh, Newton form. And once you do that, then um, combine with these uh, polynomials up here, um, like x minus x naught, x minus x naught times x minus x1, etc. And then you can actually write down the uh, whole polynomial. Okay, so what are divided differences? They're actually a lot easier to work with than to explain. Um, okay, so, so first I need to give the uh, definition. Um, so the way we write divided differences, the way we label them, is given right here. That um, we're looking for, here's our polynomial we want. Here are the um, polynomials we're combining uh, using coefficients. And these, I described them earlier. So these polynomials up here, these are the fancy n's, n0, n1, n2, and so on. Um, so the coefficients are referred to using this notation. Um, So cj is equal to f square bracket x0, x1, x2, up to xj um, is what's called a j order divided difference. So if you have j plus 1 points listed in here in a comma separated list, it's called a j order divided difference. So here's the definition given here. It's a recursive definition. So the simplest divide differences are zero order. They only have one point in square brackets. They're just function values. They're just the y values. And then the next line, when you have divide differences of two points, these are first order divide differences, you can see why they're called divided differences, because that's literally what they are. They're, di they're quotients of differences. You have y values subtracted up top, x values subtracted down below. So divided differences. Um, and then, that's a first order. Then you define higher order divided differences in terms of lower order ones. So like here I have a divided difference of order k. Here I have two divided differences of order k minus 1. And I subtract those and then divide by appropriate x values. Now the, the thing is, what I need to explain, and actually be easier to explain using a table, which points do you have in here? Because notice, okay, I'm going to magnify this a little bit, or a lot. Okay. Look at the indices that we have here. xi, i plus 1, i plus 2, up to i plus k. Um, and notice here, the indices here. What's the difference between these and these? What do we have in common, or what's different? 
Yeah, so this one is missing. Now look at the other one. It's the opposite. So here, we, um, so this first one is missing xi. This is missing xi plus k. So the first point is left off of one, the last point is left off of the other. And, um, and notice it's the missing points that are subtracted down below. Now, I would not be at all surprised, and really I couldn't find fault of anyone, if they find this definition clear as mud. Um, but it's okay, because I'm going to deal with it. Um, it's actually kind of a pain to try to get this definition to sync in this way, which is why um, we have an approach to computing these uh, divided differences that helps you to keep track of all these indices. And that is called a divided difference table. This is what you'd actually be doing like on the midterm. Um, and here it is. A divided difference table lets you keep track of all your divided differences that you need. Um, so what do you do? And the funny thing is, when I would uh, do this on the board, I'd always screw it up. Um, but I'm not writing it on the board, so ha. Huh. Um, okay, so first I have my indices. Like in this case, I have four points all together that I'm using. So I'm building a interpolating polynomial degree three. So I have uh, my indices 0, 1, 2, 3. And then whatever my x values are, those go right next to it, if, uh, your next column. Then you have divided differences of increasing order. So first your zero order divided differences. Those are just your function values. So you, you lay those out in the next column. And then what you do is um, to get your next your second order divided differences, you subtract these f of x1 minus f of x naught divided by x1 minus x naught. And that's what goes in here. Um, so basically you're putting divided differences between the items you're subtracting. So this one is f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. And then similar for this um, first order divided difference right here. Um, so that's how you get the second order ones. Now out here, the third order ones, you take the ones next to it. You're, you're going to put it here. You subtract these two, x1, x2, x1, and x1. But then you have to divide by the appropriate x's. Which ones are they? Here's how you figure it out. You start from the divide difference you want. Follow, go like go diagonally down, go down the diagonal, follow my mouse cursor here, um, and x2 is what you have um, here. And then you go the other way, go up to x0. So for this divided difference, you're subtracting. Another way to think about it is last point minus first point. So x2 minus x0. Um, similar for this one. I'm going to subtract these two, this minus this, divided by x3 minus x1. Again, last point minus first. Um, and then finally, I go out to this divide difference, a third order one, and I subtract the two that are to its left. So this minus this, and again, last point minus first. And you can also see by going diagonally down here x3 minus x0. Um, so that's how you get, you fill out your divided difference table. And what I have here below is, um, so this is the algorithm that would produce them. And fill, so basically, you think of it as filling out half of a matrix, like the, like the lower triangle of a matrix um, is what this would do. Um, so here I have an example. And um, so here I have my x values, my y values. So now I can go ahead and um, I carry out the operations here. And here we have a table. So x values here, y values here. So for instance, for this divide difference right here. So minus 4 minus 3 divided by 0 minus a minus 1. So that gives me minus 7. Or uh, this one over here. I have... Um, I'm using these two. So minus 11 minus 9 is minus 20, but I'm divided by, dividing by 2 minus 0. So that gives me a minus 10. And so on. Um, so you just go ahead and fill out the table by uh, uh, performing the right subtractions of uh, two divided differences immediately to its left, divided by the x values that come from the last and first points that are listed in your divided difference. And uh, 
So any questions, and, and I strongly urge you to take a look at this example um, on your own, where you can see for yourself um, what's used to obtain each divided difference. It's all laid out there. Um, but does, does anyone have any questions about how the table gets completed? Um, and once you have that, here's what you do. Um, okay, so I have it written out here what the form of the Newton polynomial looks like. You basically take the divided differences off the top row. And you, you needed all of them to get this far. But if you just read off the top row, um, then you have, um, so your first term comes from your zero order divided difference, the three here. The net, then you have f of x on x1, your first order divided difference, times your next Newton polynomial, x minus x0. And then you have your third order, third order divided difference times x minus x0, x minus x1. And then finally, this one times x minus x0, x minus x1, x minus x2. And notice which linear factors do you use. You, use, um, you look at, in your divide difference, every point except the last are what you include here. Um, so now the thing is, that's one way to get the Newton polynomial. Another way is if you look, read the divide differences off the bottom, you can use those too, except the polynomials you're multiplying them by would be different. So I would have, for instance, I'd be going from the right and backwards. So I'd have fx3 as my first term, and then f of x2, x3 times x minus x3 times minus 11, and then minus 10 times x minus x3, x minus x2, and then this times x minus x3, x minus x2, x minus x1. So it would, if you were to multiply them all out, you would get the exact same polynomial. Uh, so you can pick either one you want uh, just because of uh, uniqueness. But either form can be advantageous depending on if you were to add new points. Like let's suppose I want to add another point down here, like uh, x4 is equal to 3, let's say. Here's what would happen. I would keep all of this. All I have to do is complete, I'd have to fill in the y value down here, and then I would have to complete the, a new bottom row of the uh, table, and I have another divided difference out to the right here. Uh, which would, and, uh, and then I would have to add one more term. So whatever divided difference I get that's written out here times x minus x0, x minus x1, x minus x2, x minus x3. Um, so it's easily modified in that case. Um, whereas if I wanted to add a point up here, I'd have to create a new top row um, and modify the polynomial uh, uh, from there. Um, so so the, the Newton form is very adaptable in a sense in terms of having to uh, add points uh, to your interpolating polynomial. That way you can uh, keep all the work you've done to fill in the uh, uh, table. So in fact, you can say that um, in a Newton form, um, a po like, so the interpolating polynomial to be n plus 1 is equal to the 1 at uh, pn times this quantity, which is um, really just a coefficient, and then times the next product of linear factors. Right. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, right, so like I said, you should, you should really look at the um, example more closely uh, to get, get a feel for how. Also, um, you can see an example in the uh, practice midterm. Uh, there's a problem there where a divided difference table is worked out, and then the entire interpolating polynomial formed uh, from there. Um, now, one thing I want to point out in um, the exploration about this, where you write code to fill in a divided difference table. So in the problem specified, you can write a function where your inputs are um, actually, yeah, the inputs are the x values and the y values. So you have vectors of x's, vectors of y's. Um, so you can think of this as since we have d, i, j, you're filling in the entries of a matrix. But notice that um, i 
is always greater than or equal to j. So I'm going to make a remark here about this problem. So exploration 6.3.6, .6, implementing, like I said here, six alg, algorithm 6.3.4, um, that the um, you're computing d i j, where i, if you look at the, whoops, dang it. I is always greater than or equal to J, and you can confirm that right here from a for loop. Notice I starts at N, N minus 1, and so forth, and stops at J. So if I is always greater than or equal to J, um, what you're doing is you're filling in a lower triangular uh, matrix. Um, so like when you did Gaussian elimination in pre-26 solving systems, like to get to... Um, Row echelon form. That's the opposite. You're creating an upper triangular matrix, but this is lower triangular. Um, but I want to make you aware, make you aware of a certain gotcha. Watch your indices, um, because a lot of times when describing mathematical algorithms, it's very convenient to use zero as an index. That's what I have here. So here I have i and j ranging from zero up to n. Uh, so like you have an n plus one by n plus one. Um, matrix. Um, so the algorithm uses zero-based indexing. But as you've seen, MATLAB uses one-based indexing. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, much of this will still um, translate in a fairly straightforward manner. Um, but like for instance here, this loop right here, I is going to go from, I guess, in terms of the index here, we really have to start from 1 to n plus 1 to work in MATLAB, otherwise it will give you an error. But uh, and then you'd be value, you're taking your y values, uh, your, your corresponding y values, y1, y2, up to y n plus 1, because that would be represented as a vector in, in, in MATLAB. Um, so, but something like, like this, um, this would translate directly um, but again, you have to be careful with your indices. Uh, so when, so, so the indice, if, if something is used as an index, you have to shift it by one from what's written uh, uh, down here. Uh, so, so be careful about that. And what you can do, what I strongly suggest is um, test your code using the data from example, um, this example here that I was using, 6.3.5. Um, so use the same x and y. Um, you should get the same divided difference table. So, so at least you can confirm um, that uh, that it's working. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, now I'm running out of time, but what I actually had not planned to talk about today, anyway is the second part of this. Once you have the divided difference coefficients, those give you a certain form of a polynomial, but it's not the most convenient form because you like, we like power form. Uh, that's the easiest certainly for, to write down. It's also pretty easy to evaluate. Um, how do we get from Newton form to power form? And that's what I'll spend time talking about on uh, Thursday. Um, so that gets into an algorithm called nested multiplication. And there's a long, drawn out, very detailed example um, also in this section about um, how, how, to, uh, um, how to use that. So the idea is really by the time you get through this course, and, if you, and especially if you continue on into the second one, you would have a whole library of your own routines that you wrote yourself to implement several numerical algorithms. Now granted, these things may already be available in MATLAB or other languages, but it's your own code that you can uh, been used for whatever purposes. What? Oh. Oh, okay. Um, well, unless anybody has any questions, I'm ready to wrap up anyway. So. You guys are so quiet. Okay. Okay. I know. I just want to get out of here too. But yeah. <laughs> okay. If you want to, yeah. 
Um, um, like, yeah, because what I, what I, even for homework one, I had some students like more than one email, and I just take it all at once when it's time to grade it. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I can like put suggested deadlines, um, like for homework three. So, all right. But so, looking forward to everyone else's homework two getting in. But again, I haven't seen questions, many questions about homework two, uh, the section 2.2, .2, floating point arithmetic. So if you didn't want to ask him here, that's fine, but then shoot me an email or something. Yeah. <clears throat>